How's it going, everybody? Brent Elvers and Dave Meltzer here, Wrestling Observer Radio, June 27, 2024, figure four, online.com, slash wrestlingobserver.com. we got a lot of news to get into here today, and uh, we're going to start with all the bad news. Dave, the death of Sika. Yeah, I mean, I wrote a big, big story um, the other day, on it yesterday, I guess, and then uh, got more coming up in the issue tomorrow, but, uh, you know, he was... Uh, it was he was from this area. I mean, there's a lot of stuff as far as like uh, Offensika that was, um, you know, that when you grow up here and everything, you hear about it. I mean, it's some some embellished. You know, we used to talk to Patterson. Patterson always Pat Patterson always told the story about how when he was a heel. So this would be um, late the late '60s, early '70s, like '69, uh, '70, '71. He was a heel. And Peter Maivia was a baby face. And that's when a, a lot of Samoans started attending matches at the Cow Palace. I mean, there were, you know, a couple hundred, I would think. I mean, I went to some of the shows. I mean, there was a lot. And they could get really rowdy, you know, when Peter Maivia was selling. And if he was getting wronged and if he lost, it was not always a pretty sight. Um, and... Alpha and Sika were fans at the time, and uh, Patterson used to talk about how, you know, the scary part of, of wrestling was after the match, trying to get through those fans back to the dressing room. Um, you know, that's one of his Pat, Pat stories. Um, I mean, he told it to me, you know, a dozen times over the course of 20 years, you know, over and over. But, um, you know, they the, the legend was that you know roy shire um you know thought that there was a potential security problems and peter maivia had had become friends with them um through i think their their father and you know they got them training i mean everyone is saying how peter maivia trained them but i had always heard it was jerry monty um who trained them and and i know that when jerry monty started his wrestling school he always took credit for it but um but they were trained here with the idea of getting them on the road and um when i you know by the time i started going they were it was right around the time they were leaving so i never saw i never saw often Sika in the crowd at the cow palace when i went they were already just starting their careers by this point and they both started in uh arizona for a kurt von steiger and then um, after that, they went to Calgary as a tag team. And that's when they got started making their name. And it was, you know, interesting because in those days, you know, you kind of knew who everybody was in wrestling. They would go from territory to territory. And after a couple of years, you know, guys would start getting pushed and things like that. And when Afan Sika came to Calgary in 73, they had worked a few months in Arizona. But Arizona was one of these places that was so under the radar that nobody... You know, they, we barely even knew it existed, and I was studying everything. Um, so, I mean, I mean, I knew it existed, but, like, I mean, my, my first knowledge of Afa and Sika um, was when they were um, international tag team champions, like, within probably a month of getting there, and they had never wrestled anywhere, and it was kind of like, you know, who are these guys? They were called the Samoans at the time, I believe, or maybe the Islanders. And then... Um, I think the even bigger was we went to when they went to Vancouver because Vancouver was on national television in Canada and Vancouver had if you looked at the roster of the guys that you know Gene Kaniski was the promoter uh, with Sandra Kovacs and Gene Kaniski was one of the biggest stars in wrestling and so um, you know even though you know they really had Vancouver Victoria and other cities in BC it wasn't like large population base um, they had a real high level of talent because you know Kaniski and Don Leo Jonathan were there and always really high level and those guys came in and i remember the original reviews that they were you know two big guys who were not very good you know like you know they were very green at the time and but they put them over for the tag team titles and then you know they were on their way they went everywhere um you know i mean almost every circuit i would say they went to at one point or another there were a few that they missed but they would just go from place to place they really settled in pensacola which is, you know, pretty much where they moved the family. You know, um, they all were from San Francisco, um, you know, the, the Usos and Roman and everything. And then they all wound up in Pensacola 
and um, lived there. You know, that's where um, Roman Reigns grew up. That's where uh, his brother Matt grew up, the Usos and everyone like that. And um, that's kind of where um, they ended up being based. And then they got the break uh, when they went to uh, WWF. This would have been in uh, end of 79, I think, is when they went there, um, early 80, um, as the Wild Samoans with Captain Lou Albano. So early in their career, the Samoans were the you know, stereotypical Samoans, you know, uh, gimmick, which was probably created by Nef Maiava, maybe even Oni Wiki Wiki before that. There were, you know, Samoan wrestlers. Um, they generally did headbutts, barefoot, wore the beads around their neck, always smiling, long hair, you know, um, happy Samoans. You know, that was like the, the deal. And the Islanders basically you know, were that those guys. And it was limiting because they weren't really strong on promos. They were big, tough guys. They weren't really flashy in the ring or anything like that. Um, their true calling was definitely his heels with a good talking manager. And, you know, as the years went by, um, you know, I would say late 70s, they started working as heels. And by the time they were in WWE, you know, that was that was probably their best run. They'd got a lot bigger by that point. I mean, they were both probably, you know, 300 pounds when they first went to WWE and, and, and everything. And with Albano, and they were, the you know, dominant heel tag team. They were the heel. WWE's, the way that they wrote, did, did the business in those days. Um the tag team title, the singles title was always held by Babyface, and the tag team title would be predominantly held by a heel, and they would have a Babyface win um, when the heel was leaving the territory and then bring in a new heel. And it was rotating, you know, every six, nine months a year, new heel team comes in. It's always one heel team. And, you know, the Samoans, when they were the originally they were just the Samoans, and then they became the Wild Samoans, um, were the team that came in. And they were pushed uh, more than most as far as, like, getting singles main events, like with Bob Backlund. Um, Seeky even got a Saturday Night's main event match with Hulk Hogan. This was later in his career, actually, but after they broke up his team. And, um, you know, they were there for several years. They were, you know, everywhere. Went to Japan, went to Europe, you know, Germany, Hanover Tournament. Um, you know, the different runs in WWF and... Um, they wrestled, um, you know, I mean, they mid south. They were, I would say, like, they were really big in mid south because Bill Watts liked them. Because Bill Watts liked the big tough guys. And he put them with Ernie Ladd as their manager at first. And then they turned on Ernie Ladd and went with Skandor Akbar. And they worked a lot. You know, JYD, Junkyard Dog, was the top star. Dick Murdoch was probably the number two babyface star. And they worked a lot with JYD and Murdoch. Um, Worked a couple of they worked a couple of Superdome shows. They worked some New Japan at the time. Uh, went back to WWF, you know, and uh, had another run um, as tag team champions. They had the uh, Shea Stadium match with Bob Backlund and Pedro Morales, which was the Bruno Zabisco Shea Stadium show, which was the biggest gate in history. So they were like third third from the top, I guess. Maybe you could argue second from the top. I mean, the Bruno match was the main event. Um, Hogan and Andre and the tag title match were the other two ones. And the tag title match, it, it was Backlund, who was the singles champion, going for the tag title with Pedro Morales, and they won them. And that was a really weird thing because the build was, uh, you know, Bob Backlund was talking about, you know, winning two belts, and Morales was talking about winning two belts because Morales was, you know, the former champion and, and everything like that. And so then they win the titles at Shea Stadium, and then they vacate the titles. And then they end up with the Samoans back as champions until um, Seek broke his ankle. They kept the belts on them, and they brought in Sam Samula in there at that point. And um, they were there when uh, they did the expansion in 84. They were still there. They, were, they turned babyface with Albano against Murdoch and Adonis, and then they... They, you know, weren't phased out. I think they quit and ran some overseas stuff and everything. But that was, they never really had a big run. And Afa kind of retired. Sika came back with Curtis Aokea as the wizard, as his manager, teaming with Kamala. And then Kamala quit. So he became single. And he was there through um, 88, I think. And, uh, 
you know, pretty much was done full time wrestling by this point, and um, you know, continued, um, did some indies, helped train Yokozuna, who was his nephew, and um, of course, you know, um, helped Roman Reigns get in his son, the Usos, which were uh, Matt, even before Roman Reigns, Matt, who was um, Rosie. Um, got in, you know, and um, with when, when he, Rosie and um, Eddie, uh, who was who later became Umaga, you know, they started together, um, you know, training the next generation and everything like that. And um, but yeah, I mean, this, the the Wild Samoans were a a, a a a strong, memorable act because they were, you know, during an era where wrestling characters were unique. I remember like. Uh, Dwayne Johnson, you know, years and years ago, um, we were talking and he was like always complaining about how, you know, wrestling was getting too homogenized. Um, everybody's looking the same. Everybody's wrestling the same. And he goes, they need characters like Buddy Rose and the Samoans. Those were the guys he brought up, I guess, because, you know, he grew up in Portland during the Buddy Rose heyday. And uh, guys that didn't have necessarily good bodies, but were just you know, unique characters. So he was a fan of those guys, and, you know, and obviously they were pretty much family by that point. And, um, but yeah, uh, often Sika were, uh, I mean, they were one of the big tag teams of the seventies and eighties. Um, and, uh, you know, big fans as far as uh, growing up, they never came back here except for a quick run. I always thought, you know, once they were going everywhere, they were going to come to as baby faces. They'd come to San Francisco as big baby faces, you know, growing up here and all that. And um, they came here once. It was, but it was the very. It was at the at the end of the promotion, and there really wasn't much money to be made. And they were in. Uh, they were pushed. They never got to the tag team ti world tag team titles, and um, they left pretty quick, you know, and went to more lucrative territories. But, um, yeah, I mean, I remember I was thinking that, like, you know, when did they bring off Enziki here? They grew up here, you know? I mean, it's like they're, they're uh, you know, I mean, it was, a, it was a natural. And, you know, Roy knew him and everything like that. Roy helped him get started. But for whatever reason, they never had a big run here. They never had a big run in Oregon either, um, you know, which was one of those places you would think almost everybody went through in that era. But for whatever reason, they didn't go there. They were barely in Los Angeles, you know, you know, I mean, they, they were there for like a cup of coffee. So even though they were West Coast guys, most of their stuff was, uh, you know, Southeast and, um, you know, they, Leroy McGurk, Mid-South Wrestling later. And of course the WW, WWF runs, um, the Sheik, they worked for the Sheik. They worked up in, um, Ontario for, um, Tunney and, uh, they'd some, some Montreal, Japan, you know, with IWE and then later New Japan. So they were, you know, uh, Puerto Rico. They were very big in Puerto Rico as well. And uh, Puerto Rico is where they really got big as heels. You know, the Wild Samoans Act um, that was, was in WWE, that act pretty much started in uh, Puerto Rico when they were doing that, you know, you know full-time, you know, heels, getting rid of this the, the baby face smiling deal. Also, want to wish the best to Pat McAfee. His father-in-law passed away, which was why he missed Raw on Monday. Yeah. He'd been in the hospital with an infection, and they thought he had turned the corner, and then all of a sudden it got really bad, and he passed away. So all the best to Pat. Yeah, that's uh, really sad. And, you know, so we, we talked about that on Monday, and we thought that it was, um, you know, the angle, because they were doing the angle, you know, um, during that day. They actually did the angle during the day on the show, and... They were doing stuff with the angle on uh, television that night. I mean, the package was to Pat McAfee. So, I mean, the thing was scheduled. They they are they were doing an angle, but that is not why he missed the show. Um, I guess he got the word, um, you know, between the time he finished his regular show and when uh, he would be going to Raw. Also, the passing of Gunther Zapp. Yeah, Gunther Zapp. Is, Gunther Zapp was... Uh, German sports announcer who was actually a, um, an athlete when he was younger. He played 10 years of American football. They had a German um, pro, fo pro football and not soccer, American football league, and he was a defensive back. And then uh, this is years and years ago and um, ended up being um, the Munich Cowboys 
was the team. And then he ended up being president of the team. He got into broadcasting. Um, he started broadcasting WWF uh, in 93 for about two decades. Uh, did NFL, um, you know, Major League Baseball, um, and many other sports uh, in uh, Olympics in Germany. Um, and for the last five years or so, he was uh, also doing the AEW broadcasts. Um, and uh, Oliver Kopp, who's uh, you know one of our friends, was very, very close to him for 30 years and uh, spoke very highly of him. Um, just a great guy to hang around. Um, they did the uh, they did the Wembley show together um, wow. in German. Yeah, yeah. And um, he had, had he was diagnosed with cancer in April and uh, passed away. Uh, you know today. All the best, to Oliver, his friends and family. For everybody that we just mentioned, and we do yeah. actually have some good news, Rhea Ripley and Buddy Matthews got married yesterday, so congratulations to them. Yeah, 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 in Australia. I mean, we knew that they were going to Australia together. That's why they did the angle with um, Buddy being injured, but I did not know they were going there to get married. What's up with Dax and Brett? Ah, oh, they just did that deal that, that you did. Just showed up on the birthday, you know? It was Dax's 40th birthday. Remember my 50th birthday? I just showed up? Well, well, it was actually not my birthday. They swerved me. Yes. See, yes. So so I had actually, I remember we were at a UFC show, and I told you that they're going to throw a surprise birthday party for me because I knew they would, right? But they outsmarted me because my birthday is in October, and they did it in July. Mm. So that was like, that was like really clever. So, you know, they said, we got to go to this restaurant. And they were like, you know, got to go to the restaurant, got to go to the restaurant. It's like, okay, I get in there and, you know, there you were. Yes. You know, that's where I first met Whitney, right? That weekend? I believe so, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So anyway, uh, Dax's 40th birthday was, uh, I think it was today or yesterday. And uh, Bret Hart showed up at the house. Wow. Yeah, you know, so. So he was thrilled. That's like one of his favorite. Sure he was. Well, happy birthday to Dax. Happy birthday. And yeah, it was one of his favorite wrestlers, maybe his favorite wrestler. So he just was there. It's like he looked and he goes, what are you doing here? You know, but he was there. So. Well, my favorite wrestler is certainly Bret Hart after the final episode of Who Killed WCW. Yeah. <laughs> uh, smartest guys in the whole documentary. He knew his stuff. Uh, it was exactly what we thought. It was all about rehabbing Eric Bischoff in the end. Looking out into the sunset as the show ended, he was a great guy. He had so many great ideas, but he was just fucked by those executives. And God, well, I mean, they did have B Booker T and Brett both blamed him. But yeah. but but the pro it was very much it was very much a, a, a yeah a rehab project on, on Bischoff. You know, almost to the well. I don't want to do conspiracy theories. It's not really fair, but you know when you consider, I mean, it's not like they didn't put Brett on. It's not like they didn't put Bill Goldberg on. You know, I mean, it's not like they were out there not wanting dissenting views. But and and a lot of the stuff, you know, in the episode, they did talk about the losses. You know, um, Guy Evans. You well, know, they did, but they blamed him on everything but the product sucking. Uh, they there said, was, there oh, were, you know, there was a lot of transferring from other divisions that were failing. <laughs> I was like, really? Well, huh. it, 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 you know, that went both ways. Yes. they The other divisions uh, helped pay for gigantic contracts. I points. mean, like, I, I, I'll, give, I'll give you an example. You know, like um, in 98, which was one of the biggest years, you know, the, the WCW books listed Hulk Hogan's contract at, or, or payment at $3.7 million. But Hulk Hogan was guaranteed... Six hundred seventy-five thousand dollars every pay-per-view, or fifteen percent. Okay, which would be in many of the cases, like um, let's say the 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 Hogan Sting, which let's say say did uh, you know um, nineteen point five, so about ten million dollars. So he would have made a million five on that one. He would have made about the same on um, the Rodman pay-per-view, you know, because um, they did giant, you know, the Rodman Malone pay-per-view. So that's that's in you know not in addition to the six seventy five but that's a, above and beyond. So if you if if Hogan did like eight pay per views including like those big ones, you know I mean 
That's way, way more than that. And I'm not even starting on the merchandise where he got 50% on all NWO merchandise. I mean, if you look at his contract, which is available, I mean, you'll see that it's far more than $3.7 million. So who, where exactly was that money coming from? You know, and I mean, I remember when Brett, not now Brett's, the deal that Brett signed was with WCW. It was a full deal. But the year before in 96, when uh, Brett was negotiating, um, they had, it was, it was a $2.8 million a year deal. So this is in 96. And in that deal, only 800,000 of that money was coming from WCW. The other 2 million were to make two movies a year at $1 million a year. But of course, but the deal was is that I mean they were they were gonna try to make the two movies they never did. And when he when he signed the year later, they, it was a different deal. You know, it was not that same deal. But um, but that's just an example of the exact opposite. I mean, it went both like it went both ways. I remember Jim Hurd talking to me about um, you know the pay per view revenue, and it's like you know I mean I get the number of buys we get and our percentage. Our company's getting like way less and i'm trying to figure out it doesn't add up and the fact was is that turner home entertainment was the partner with wcw in the pay-per-view so they took a cut of the pay-per-view so wcw didn't get credit for all of it of course turner home entertainment helped market it i mean so there's something to that but it's like you know um but the company yeah the company was a disaster they did mention that um, what was the the the, the pay per view? Were they the exact same pay per view? One year later, did uh, it was the February uh, the February yeah. pay per view? Yeah, yeah. Where it did um, three hundred twenty five thousand, and they came back a year later, and they were down eighty one percent with a Hogan Flair match. So I mean, that that told you that 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 that. But you know the the so so the thing on that, and this is the one that like hit me the most was there's. You know, when you go back, I mean, one of the things I'm cursed with is is a really good memory of that time period. And obviously, many of the people that were interviewed do not have that curse. Um, and some of them are just probably flat out liars, too. But the way that they were explaining everything, like Eric, Eric's thing, just an example. Eric is talking like, uh, you know, that that, uh, you know, the deal was made with WWE. And he's suspicious of it, which, by the way, he should be, um, which I'll get to in a second. But, you know, he goes like that, that they made this deal. And then down the line, all of a sudden, Stu Snyder has this big, important title in WWF at that time. And it's like, well, that's, act not, that's not even close to how it happened. Stu Snyder was the president of WWF. When they and the man who negotiated the deal, he didn't get this the title of WWF president later because some deal was made. He made the deal himself, and I don't think that Eric was lying. It's just Eric, you know. It's this looks this twenty five years ago, you know. Um, now the one who I don't believe at all was Stu Snyder, and they did go right on camera and and at, you know they kind of asked him the question, and I mean like I said this before, January eleventh. Uh, 2001, which is the day of the press conference where they announced that Fusion Media has bought WCW. When that, that day, right after that press conference, within hours, you know, um, I got a phone call from a high ranking executive in WWF who said, look, Stu Snyder, who was friends with Brad Siegel, told us that no matter what they said, they are never getting eric bischoff is not getting that company and it's like well they just had a press conference because i know they just had a press conference but Stu snyder's insisted to us that they are not getting that company now this is um jamie kellner's not hired until march this is january 11th so he knew something on january 11th because it sure did turn out that they bought the company but even when like like the way that they're portraying the thing is eric is there and and the company's losing money, and he goes, how about I buy this? They go to them. The company says no at first. Then they come to Eric. Hey, see if you can get some business partners. Maybe we want to sell. It's like, you know, um, and they put this thing, this deal together, and it's like, you know, Vince got the deal first, and he was not, it wasn't like, you know, they go, you know, like, 
Like they were, they were just like, hey, Eric, maybe you could buy it, and it's the only guy that's selling to. It's like Jerry Jarrett wanted it. I know that Jeff Blatnick had called me. There were some backers in upstate New York that were attempting to buy it. Bruno had called me. There were backers out of Pittsburgh who wanted to buy it uh, that he was involved with. Uh, Jerry Jarrett, who I didn't talk to much, but Jerry Jarrett talked to Wade Keller all the time, I believe. I don't, I don't know that as a, I mean, I know it as a fact. Um, Wade Keller would probably have a, a very good idea because Wade Keller did a great job of reporting. Um, he really should have been on, if it wasn't me or you, he should have been on this thing because, um, if his memory is, is, is like it should be, because he knows a lot of bullshit that uh you know he, he'd be able to go through a lot of bullshit on this thing but um i mean like the thing is is like they had a deal with vince vince told me this himself they had a deal at the end of 2000 with vince and the, the snag was is that vince had signed that exclusive deal with uh tnn spike and you know that and these guys you know for as much as all these stories are how they wanted to get rid of wrestling the fact is they could have sold to vince and I'm sure at a hell of a lot more money than they did or to any of these people. But the key was is that if you bought this, you had to guarantee them a wrestling show for all this time. Another thing that happened, and this, this again, I don't know if Eric knows this. I don't know if he knows it and forgot. But he's talking on this thing about how, you know, you were guaranteed two shows a week. But before Jamie Kellner was hired... They had already made the decision, and nobody said this, to cancel the Monday show. It was only going to be, TNT was not going to, you know, TNT was not going to have any more wrestling. It was going to only be on TBS, um, because they thought that TNT was uh, too high scale. So a lot of this Jamie Kellner stuff, and he did, he was the guy who, who, um, you know, you know made the final decision that rendered the value of the company pretty worthless um you know that's true but i mean it was like there were so many things going on and i am you know completely convinced that some of these dealings were because um you know brad siegel and Stu snyder were trying to put together a deal but the freaking problem was is that you know turner ted turner insisted on wrestling staying on the station um, you know, but so many of this stuff happened before Jamie Kellner. Jamie Kellner wasn't hired until March. And yeah, the first movie made was to, uh, cancel it and not only just cancel the, it, but, but that no station under their auspices, which were a lot of stations at the time would air pro wrestling. They were done with pro wrestling and that is what killed it. Um, the Eric story, you know, where he talks about how, um, you know, he gets this call from Brian Bedall, and he says, we're done. He said, oh, the deal's done. We've made it. And he goes, no, 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 we're done. We're out of it. It's like, that's a good story, and he's told it before. But the day that, you know, Brian, you lived through this thing. You know, we were we were on the air freaking every day when this was going on. And, you know, you'll remember by the end, I mean, we knew, you know, we knew that the thing was falling apart. It wasn't like it just... It wasn't like it was the deal is ready to go, and then one day it fell apart. This thing was falling apart from the announcement, not so much from the announcement, but from um, you know when when Kellner the day, put it this way, the day Kellner said that the whole thing was had fallen apart, and before that they had it. So it, it was like once that happened, and I remember I called Eric up, you know, um, right after that. Uh, the, the other thing which they didn't talk about when they were. Which, which I guess may be too much in the weeds, but really isn't. You know, they were talking about all the money they raised, $60 million or whatever, to get this thing. You know, a lot of the financing, a lion's share of it was from Warburg Pincus. They were going to back it. And Warburg Pincus, you know, this is now this would be after January 11th. They were going through the books of WCW, and they found it to be far worse than they thought it would be. And they backed out. I mean, and I remember this one because because Wade Keller had had wrote, written that the backing had fallen apart, and I had not heard that. He had that before I did, and as soon as I heard that, I called up Bischoff, and Bischoff said it's a lie, it's not true, it's not true. We didn't come to find out, of course, it was true. So the idea that you know, and that's one of the things is that they didn't have all that money to buy it. Then again, did they have enough more money to buy it than than 
$4.2 million or $2.5 million, however you want to tab that sale, which I'll get to in a second. Of course they did. They had way more than that, but they didn't have, you know, $60 million. Um, you know, and then, you know, other, but other people had, there were other people out there that were willing to buy this thing for 15 and 20 million. Jared in particular, and Jared never could understand. I remember Jared telling me, he goes like, I couldn't, um, you know, we were offering way more than Vince and he wouldn't negotiate with us at all. And then when I talked with people at TBS, their, their belief was, is that they did not trust that any of these people, which would include Eric's group, really had the money that they say they had or they did or that it was spread over payments and time and they thought they weren't going to get paid okay the problem was is that even if they didn't have the 20 million and maybe they would have defaulted later um but maybe the, the feeling was you know because at this point they're not they're no longer they no longer care that they can keep the product alive because the reality was is that um the uh you know they'd already canceled the tv at this point when this is going down so it didn't even matter you know like they weren't they weren't doing it because we want to keep our wrestling and vince is the only one we trust that will not bankrupt this wrestling company um i mean it was just a a, a money thing and you know vince got it for for you know the original deal was 2.5 million dollars um the 4.2 million actually they said 4.3 but whatever it is that the other 1.7 was for the tape library and um you know obviously it was an incredible steal for for wwf at the time but um there were so many fishy things that were going down but when they asked snyder and he said like you know he had no idea it's like you were telling everyone the day you're telling everyone the day that went down that it wouldn't happen and and um you know that was one where it was like man I wish I was on the show because there's so much stuff that I remember going down day by day during that period. And um, I know that, uh, you know, I mean, there's a reason, obviously, you know, I mean, uh, that I wasn't there. And there's a reason you weren't there, you know, but it could have been Wade Keller, you know, who did a great job on reporting it. But, um, you know, and then, you know, like I said, a lot of the st there's a lot of stuff like even Brad, Brad Siegel was. Uh, he said something, you know, as far as like, you know, his timeline was were completely off, um, you know. But it's again, it's it's people trying to recount, you know, to to Brad Siegel, wrestling was not a big part of his life. Like his memory of this stuff, I mean, it's like it was like one of those disastrous things he was involved in. You know, he ain't gonna remember stuff in the right order or anything like that from you know twenty plus years ago. Um, you know, it's not like it was a big thing to him like it would be to say me. You know, because we didn't want we didn't want to see what ha what would would happen with wrestling as what i expected would happen with wrestling when wcw was gone and ecw was gone which would not be a pretty thing and it was not a pretty thing and wrestling went through a pretty major downturn right at that point and that's the last thing you know i wanted to see and what and the, way, the way it was covered and everything but um you know like like i think that that was the thing that bothered me was again like the other episodes um, this one bothered me less than some of the other ones, but just the fact that there was so much off from a timing standpoint, so many bad memories, and nobody, you know, it wasn't like Russo was a big part of this one, but there was just so much stuff that it was just like, you know, you need someone to explain that so many of these guys have just forgotten too much of this stuff, and so much of it didn't happen the way they said it, and, um, you know, and not even the malicious stuff and again some of it was it did sure seem like it was a reclamation project you know um and you know in the end you know whether it was you know you know at the end it's it's Dwayne's thing and uh you know i'm sure it went the way that they wanted it for whatever reason and i don't know what that reason was like i said they didn't exclude brett um sting didn't want to do it their story was that rick flair you know wanted too much money which could be true that Jamie Kellner wouldn't talk, you know, um, you know, and he had passed away. They tried to get him. But, um, yeah, I mean, from a media standpoint, I mean, you know, they, they needed a media guy. They needed a media guy bad on this one um, because there was way too much stuff that, uh, way too much bullshit and way too much stuff that was important to the story timeline-wise that uh, they really botched up.
Well, on the modern uh, side of the things, let's talk about the loss of cable homes and the ratings. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I did the, the yeah. I just got a, a thing. It'll be in the Observer tomorrow. Um, essentially, um, the number of homes that the major cable stations, which would be TBS, TNT, USA, FS1, uh, ESPN, it's about a little over sixty-seven million. You know, every time we get one of these things, the number gets lower and lower. So that's the new number. So they're in basically. 54.8% of the homes that have television in the United States get the major cable stations, TBS, TNT, USA, and all that. Um, but in 18 to 49, the number ranges from, you know, the, the number's probably at about 39.1% um, of the 18 to 49s. So when you see that number, you know, of 18 to 49s, and say compare it to a few years ago when you know the number was when 70 percent of the homes had it um you know these a lot of these drops that you see whether it's you know for challenge you know for for any of the tv shows you know real housewives any of the tv shows wrestling whatever you know you go back a couple of years they're not really declining as much as um you know, the, you know, homes are going away. And, of course, there's also more competition from streaming, way more, you know, each year as well. But, um, you know, like I was seeing, you know, one of the big stories in sports was how is the NBA getting so much money when these last finals, when the ratings are down in the last finals? And it's like, well, of course they're down because they've dropped, you know, probably 7% in homes um, you know, cables dropped seven percent in homes over the last year, so of course it's going to be down. WWE is bucking the trend. WWE is doing doing great, but um, you know, if they were doing average, uh, they would be you know, average would be down, down, down. You know, and so um, that kind of has to be understood. And I, I don't know why, but even people who analyze ratings, you know, they'll compare it like like they'll do a thing of like um, you know, obviously WWE, WNBA is really bucking the trend, but uh, more than anybody. Because they're doing records with less homes, they're doing records. You know, and that's the value. That's that's your star power. They got a Hulk Hogan on their in their in their uh, business. That's the deal. Um, as far as the ratings go, a lot of interesting stuff on the ratings this week. Um, Sma I, you know, there's there's a lot of um, the the charts and things like that are much harder to come by something happened about a week and a half ago and um it's become not impossible um and, and, I'll, and I'll be able to get ratings and quarters for for at least a lot of the stuff and ratings for everything but um as far as like charts and things it's it's going to be a lot harder i will be able to get entertainment charts every week but not the full chart as far as i i will be able to get full charts on many days um certainly on AEW days and and some WWE days but um you know not as much for the other shows um you know i think it's going to be pretty much impossible to get tna ratings not that we ever talk about them but it just is going to be and uh but anyway um like SmackDown, there were there were sports obviously that beat SmackDown. Um, you had your NBA and NHL playoffs. You had the um, Copa America on Univision, which did a giant number, things like that. But SmackDown's 0.73 was the top entertainment show on television, on all of television last week. That great rating that did on Friday night. Um, and then um, Raw was the top entertainment show on cable. And... Um, House of the Dragon on on uh, HBO was second. NXT, you know, doing that great rating this last week was third. Dynamite fell to seventh at 0.16, and Collision was eleventh. Um, so anyway, as far as these shows themselves, NXT was back down to normal after that giant number last week, um, 611,000 viewers and 0.18. Um, you know, they had main roster people there, especially in that battle royal, but. Um, you know, whatever it was last week that did it, it was, uh, you know, this week was, again, right back, to, was back to where it usually is. Now, Raw had freaking, and, and they didn't have tough competition either, I mean, at all. Now, Raw had tough competition. Raw had the um, um, NHL seventh game, 
which did a giant number. Where now I did hear I have not got the, you know, Raw, Raw and SmackDown both got killed in Canada this week because of the NHL playoffs. But in the United States, yeah, obviously NHL is not as big in the United States, but still it was a seven point seven million viewers. It's a pretty giant number for that. And then the College Baseball World Series, they had the Olympic trials that were on NBC. They had real competition. And they still did 1,814,000 viewers in an 0.61. So it was the best rating for Raw since uh, the Monday after WrestleMania. Um, and, I mean, it's funny because when I got the number, I mean, the first thing I saw was uh, this giant number. And I go like, what the hell was this? Because the competition was really tough. I know that the Bray Wyatt thing, you know, or um, tribute thing, the the Wyatt Six thing, probably had momentum. So I went to look at the YouTube views, trying to figure out, okay, what's hot right now? And that was the hottest thing, that and the Liv Morgan Dominic stuff. But the interesting thing is when the quarters came out, the Liv Morgan Dominic stuff was the high point of the show, along with the segment with Seth Rollins, Gunter, and Damian Priest. Those segments did over 2 million viewers each. Um, that was the key to the rating. In fact, the uh, lowest rated segment was the one with Bray Wyatt and Uncle Howdy, which was the highest YouTube thing. So you're getting kind of contradictory messages, but that's how it went. But it was, an, you know, um, both Raw and SmackDown did excellent ratings uh, this week against, you know, NHL playoff competition. So, you know, to, to do that with that competition, there was something really big. But, yeah, the the return of Rollins is a big deal, you know. Um, collision on uh, Saturday night did 429,000 viewers in 0.14. Uh, so it was up, even though it was a taped show. Um, be, but the competition was not, you know, they did not have the competition at the level they usually have. Um, but it was... I guess the one positive, I, well, I mean, there's there's positives. The the rating was pretty steady, um, you know, um, and and in fact, you know, usually with a, with AEW and WWE shows, um, or with Raw, the uh, you know you get the big drop, you know, like like the the main event is never, you know, one of the higher rated segments of the show, in you know generally for AEW and almost never for Raw, you know, just because people tune out. At the, in, at the end of the show. But um, the Will Ospreay Brian Cage match, which was a great match, um, that was successful. They pretty much had, um, you know, the Hechicero match with uh, Matt Menard did not do well, but the they did uh, 446,000 viewers and uh, 191,000 in 18 to 49. So they were actually above the average for the show, which is very rare for, not, I mean, unusual not not unheard of but unusual for for aw so that was a success um you know but uh you know they 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 had an easier night they did not have the big sports playoffs they did have copa america which did a giant number on univision um they did have um college baseball world series which did a very good number um there was something else the other oh, yankees braves game um Olympic trials. So a lot of they had they had a lot, but it wasn't as tough as NBA playoffs. And they didn't have UFC because UFC went in the afternoon. So um, I guess that's the main thing. And then uh, Combate Global coming on, on Univision did an 0.29 at like midnight. So, you know, they did a, a great number, but that was, you know, boosted very greatly by Copa America. So, um, you know, the Spanish... MMA uh, did 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 pretty big. Um, UFC did 975,000 uh, viewers for, on the ABC for the afternoon with the Robert Whitaker fight. So that's the rating story. All right, we're going to start with Dynamite here, and then we'll talk about the lineup for Forbidden Door when we're done. Open up with a promo segment with MJF and Daniel Garcia. And the gist of this segment is that MJF announced that I am going to give you a shot at me again. We wrestled once before for the world title. I beat you handily. I'm going to give you another shot at Wembley. And Garcia, I mean, they got a pop, but it didn't look like a giant pop, because I think people were expecting the man who came out next, which was Will Ospreay. Yeah. And he came out, and he said, not only will I give you your international title shot next week, Garcia, I'm going to give you a shot at the world title as well. So MJF is just in the corner stewing, 
And then Osprey left. MJF said, that's a big opportunity for you, Daniel. And he stormed off. So my guess is that uh, Will Osprey is beating Daniel Garcia uh, next week, and then it will be MJF and Osprey at Wembley. I guess they could make it a three-way, but I don't know if that would be a good idea. I wouldn't do it, but if they make it a three-way, it tells me that they don't want to be either of them. Uh, you know, and it's a way to protect that. Yeah. But, um, yeah. I think what, you know, I think one thing is clear is that it's not going to be Will Ospreay challenging for the title at Wembley. No. That seems uh, out the window at this point. Yeah. John Moxley and Claudio Castagnoli and Wheeler Yuta versus Shingo, Hiromu, and Teton. And they had a very, very fun match, but at the until, end... And the finish was just kind of a way to get out of the match. Hiromu went for the time bomb, and Mox hit him with a chair for the DQ. A rare AW day DQ. And then we had a huge brawl afterwards. Naito's music hits. He came down to the ring, and he got into he a... Sure, he sure took his time. He sure did. And then Mox attacked him, and they brawled. And then Shingo got a hold of Wheeler and was laying in the elbows, and Danielson, who was doing commentary, hit the ring to make the save. And the crowd chants let them fight, but they did not fight. So just another build for the Danielson-Shingo match, which is a uh, tournament match. Yeah, on the pay-per-view. Yeah. They'll, they'll have, they'll have a, a killer match. They should, yeah. Yeah, I, I don't see any way around it. They're going to have a killer match, yeah. Also a great match was Jay White and Phoenix. Owen Hart Cup match, the... Too, 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 too short, but Ray Phoenix was fantastic. They uh, they ejected Penta, the Ass Boys, and Juice, and boy, did that ref get booed for that. And even Taz noted, the fans always go crazy for ejections. They did not yeah. today. Well, the funny thing is, is it made it better, because if that match had a million run-ins, it wouldn't have been nearly as good. So we had some great big spots at the end, and then Jay hit a brain buster. Phoenix kicked out. He went for the Blade Runner. Phoenix cradled him. They went back and forth. And Jay grabs him, hits the Blade Runner, and gets the pin. So Jay White in the semis of the against, Owen Hart Cup. Against the winner of Jeff Jarrett versus, looks like Adam Page, right? Well, Matt and Nick did a promo, and they said, after Forbidden Door, Jack Perry will be the champion. And they said, next week we have decided to insert our very own wild card into the Owen Tournament. And they vowed to have all the power, all the gold. They did not reveal the wild card. It could be Hangman, I guess. But be. I don't know if I want to bring Hangman back just to uh, not win the own cup. We could go to the finals. I guess he could go to the finals, but I mean, I guess we'll see. I mean, he, he could he could win. I mean, I when, when I chart everything out now, and... Um, I think I know where it's going for Wembley. I don't want to say, but actually, as a story, it's a pretty good story. I think where they're going. Um, yeah, but then you're doing the fourth straight loss for Hangman. It's yeah. Sort of. but, but, no, no, I don't think they're going to go with. I don't. Oh, I thought you were talking about. I think they go with Danielson. Well, yeah, you said you said that you could see Hangman winning the tournament, though. Did you not? What is going on with Dave's audio? Stand by, everybody. Okay. All right, Dave's back. We're going to hope it works this time. His internet at this time of night, not always good. Acclaimed then came down to the ring, and uh, they did their promo about how they're going to win the tag titles from the Young Cucks, which got bleeped every time. And then... They got... They, okay, the, 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 there's definitely something that's changed in uh, WBD when it comes to language, because... They were bleeping tame stuff, and they used to let everything, almost everything, go before. So um, somebody somewhere has decided that uh, what they were doing before is uh, no longer kosher. Well, they were about to scissor when out comes Okada, and he said, scissor me, bitch, which I actually think made it through. And it the Bucks challenged a claimed and Daddy Ass to a trios match, and then Daddy Ass said, well, you know, I'm kind of a big deal. I know people in high places, including presidents. And Hiroshi Tanahashi showed up on the screen and said he was coming to Forbidden Door to fight. That reminds me of something. So it's going to be acclaimed in Tanahashi versus Okada in the Bucks. At it's a match. Door. It's, and they may, they may have a really good match, too. And I, I mean, they pushed they push that uh, Tanahashi and Okada have a great historic rivalry, um, which, you know, and all that. So... Do you know the story about uh, the debate tomorrow night? What's the story? Where they're taping it at? Where are they taping it? 
Full sale. <laughs> Actually, you're close. They're not taping a full sale. They're taping it at uh, the studios where um, Georgia Championship Wrestling was taped. Wow. All those years. It's wow. CNN. It's going to be the same studio with Gordon Soley and Tommy Rich and Dusty Rhodes and Ric Flair and, and uh, you know. Um, I hope David Crockett is there to hold the mic up for him or something. Yeah. I don't think he's going to be there. Freddie Miller is not going to be there to introduce him either. That's for sure since he died years ago. But, um, yeah, yeah, that's the unique thing about the debate is that uh, the same hollowed grounds where Ole Anderson did that interview is going to be, that famous interview, is the same place where Donald Trump and uh, Biden are going to be debating tomorrow night. So well. maybe, one of them, maybe one of them will try to imitate that interview. We had Tony Storm, Mariah May, and Mina Shirakawa versus Anna J. Saray and Harley Cameron. And the story here is that Mariah comes out with Tony, but then goes backstage and also comes out with Mina. And Tony is not happy with that. And she did the Club Venus dance with her. Yep. And so Mina's running wild, and she ignores Tony and tags in Mariah, and then Mariah can't figure out who she should tag, and they both want to tag her. And so finally, at the end, everybody's in a big move. Mina hits the Mina driver on Anna and gets the pin. So after the match, Mariah gives champagne to Tony and Mina, and all three of them toast and drink, and everyone's happy. But then Tony grabs Mariah. She wants to dance with her. And so Mina grabs the champagne bottle, and she tries to hit Tony, but Tony moves, and she clobbers Mariah with the champagne bottle, breaks it over her head. Mariah yeah, sells knock, it like she's knocks, dead. Knocks her out. Tony's furious. And now we'll find out whose side Mariah takes on Sunday. Yep. Yeah. We had a Mercedes promo for the match with Stephanie. Stephanie's having a match on uh, Collision, and Mercedes has vowed to be there at ringside. Mm. Learning Tree came out for promo. Now, this I could not figure out for the life of me. So they come out, and... Yeah, I, I have no idea how this where we're at it with uh, coming off of this segment. Yeah, so Jericho says, everybody knows I'm here for one reason, help the young guys. And he says they took so you know, many. You know, he, you know, he, he did that right out. Yes, right, right after Cody, Cody said, don't trust people like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Cody does this interview, and he took that interview and basically turned it into his angle. Yeah. So they're claiming that. Uh, so we've got to explain that. So, so Cody Rhodes did an interview and said, like, whenever a veteran says, I'm here for the young guys, like, he's full of it. So Jericho, like, that very night, you know, like, hours later, goes in there and goes, I'm only here for the young guys. <laughs> and it's actually kind of clever. So old Brian Keith has got his arm in a sling, and Jericho says because of this, luckily we've uh, we've got a man to replace him for the match on Sunday. And this man is a Wrestling Observer Newsletter Hall of Famer, just like myself. I got this video. I haven't played it yet. I want to see it. I want to see it myself with all of you. Man, as soon as he did said that, it's you like you knew how man, it was going to go. Yeah, you know this is going. This one's going to backfire on him. So it's Minoru Suzuki, and Suzuki says, "I understand you want me to be your partner for Bin Door." But you were mistaken about one thing. I don't want to wrestle by your side. I want to wrestle you one on one. Are you trying to avoid me because you're scared? What is this learning tree? I want nothing to do with that. I will not be your partner. Instead, put your FDW title on the line and wrestle me. And so, so think, the fans thought, chant, "You fucked up." <laughs> and then Jericho, uh, you know, he's shocked. And then Joe Shabbat and Hook come out, and Joe says, "This is quite awkward." And he said, we learned tonight the learning tree is like the Jericho family tree, not enough branches. And Shibata uses the phone to say, this guy sucks. Joe slaps, uh, Jericho slaps Joe. A big brawl breaks out. And when it was over, I think it's still a six-man. We don't know who's replacing Brian Keith. We know it's not Minoru Suzuki. And maybe Jericho's wrestling twice. I, I can't tell you right now. Well, maybe in the morning we'll have a better idea of all this. So um, one of the things on the show that I thought was interesting was you had Naito, you had Ishii later in the show, and you had um, Suzuki on the screen here. And none of them got big pops when usually, you know, historically at AEW shows when, you know, Naito, the, the place would go nuts because Naito has only been there a couple of times. Ishii always got a big reaction. Suzuki would get, you know, incredible reactions. So... Um, you know, now I did hear from somebody who was there who then went home and, and watched it and did say that, uh, there's some real issues because he said the crowd was so much louder than it came across. So, 
you know, maybe maybe that was the problem. But I remember like when Naito came out with the with the thing, it's it's like I expected like this big reaction because he always gets one, and uh, it really wasn't. It's like oh, this is a weird crowd. But I mean, they really didn't. You know, with the exception of like Will Osprey and MJF, I don't know that anyone got a big reaction on the show. And Dan Danny Garcia to an extent, um, but that was about it, really. We had Kyle O'Reilly and Zack Saber Jr. with Orange Cassidy on commentary, and it's they had a good match. I thought. I the mean, match the technical, the, the wrestling was technically great, but it also seemed like TV match. You're not going to get as much time as like a pay per view or something like uh, well, that. Well, it, it, it they they would have been they would have had a better match if they had more than ten minutes. But I just thought what they did was was just fantastic in that ten minutes. I mean, you can't you can't really do much better. It wasn't you know those kind of matches don't have super heat usually because um, that's just the nature of technical wrestling. But you know, other than Zach and Hitchisero the other day, which that had incredible heat doing a match like this. But um, I just thought the way they went from move to move. I mean, Kyle was right with them. I mean, that, that's like a that's like a perfect match for that style. You know, if you like technical wrestling, I mean, you got 10 great minutes of it. So then uh, Zach submits him with a kind of a Fujiwara. variation of a Fujiwara. Fujiwara Umber, yeah. And then Orange comes down to check on Kyle. The kingdom hits the ring. They shove Orange away to check on Kyle. Orange and Zach are going face to face. TMDK runs out. Is Shee's music here? It wasn't TMDK. It was Shane Haste and Robbie Eagles. They called them TMDK. Well, but yes. well, I mean, I guess they're all part of the TMDK group because Zach is as well. But, but the I always think of TMDK as as Nichols and um, and there was no Mikey Nichols. Nichols and Haste. But yeah, Robbie Robbie Eagles was there. Is Shee's music hits. He storms down to the ring, and so there's like a dozen people in the ring. And they all just look at each other for a while, and then they play Zach's music, and that was the end. I don't understand. Okay, we have the Forbidden Door card and everything, but it's like there are so many people, like Ishii and Robbie Eagles and stuff, that are just, like, around. You know, El Phantasmo, you know, people like that. I mean, he wasn't on the show tonight, but he was, was there and did, you know, did the show late, you know, the collision tapings. And it's just like... How, the, these guys aren't all going to be in. The, it's like they're bringing all these guys in for TV that aren't even. They, they 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 can't get them all on the on the Forbidden Door card to begin with. I mean, Hiromu Takahashi, Titan, they don't have matches on on the thing, do they? I don't think so. I don't. Wow. I, well, we'll go over the lineup here in a second. But Will Ospreay and Swerve versus Gates of Agony was the main event, and uh, basically the story was at points they worked together well. At points there was tension. And finally, there at the end, uh, Osprey goes for a reverse Hurricane Rana on Toa. Toa blocks it, so Osprey says, "Swerve, kick him!" And so Swerve kicks him, and he hits the move. They're working together. Hits the Os Cutter. Toa kicks out. He's, He's going to go for the hidden blade, but Bishop hits the ring. So Swerve grabs him and does the uh, snapping arm breaker, which Osprey is shocked by, and he hits the hidden blade for the pin. So the story, I presume, is that Osprey is having issues with the idea of hurting people, and Swerve has no such issues whatsoever. He will break your arm if he needs to. Yeah, that's well, I the mean, story going into Sunday. I think that that's been the story for the last couple of weeks. You know, I think that the whole thing is going to come down to uh, Osprey not hitting the Tiger Driver. At least that's... I mean, maybe they'll, they'll, they won't do that because it's, they built it so well that that seems like obvious where they're going. And sometimes people, when they do that, Instead of doing it then, sometimes they'll go and change their mind and go like, people got it figured out. But that is what they're building. So Swerve is about to leave. Osprey grabs a belt to pose with it, and Swerve responds by chop-locking him and fucking killing him with a house call. He looked like he kicked this guy so hard in the face. I, yeah. And Will went down, and after the show ended, he's just kind of stumbling around, and he gets out of the ring and calls the security guy over to help him to the back, so hopefully he's all right. It looked brutal. But uh, as far as like a go home show, I mean, I thought this was a pretty damn great show, and this is the lineup for the pay per view, which is Sunday. Swerve versus Will Ospreay for the AW title. Takeshita, Mark Briscoe, Jack Perry, Leo Rush, Dante Martin, and I don't know who for the uh, final spot in the ladder match for the TNT title. Mercedes and Stephanie Vacure, title for title. TBS and New Japan Strong Women's title. Tony Storm versus Mina. John Moxley versus Naito for the IWGP title. We've got a quarterfinal match: Brian Danielson versus Shingo, MJF versus Hechicero, Zack Saber versus Orange Cassidy, and then we have the Elite versus Tanahashi and the Acclaimed. 
Learning tree, apparently. Jericho, Big Bill, and somebody versus Samoa Joe, Hook, and Shibata. And on the pre-show, Statlander and Momo Watanabe versus Willow Nightingale and Tam Nakano. So yeah. That's the lineup for for Bindor. Mm-hmm. So then uh, a couple of notes from the the NXT show. So we had Tyler Bate. We had a gauntlet match for the tag team titles. It was Tyler Bate, Pete Dunne, Edgerson Ofe, Malik Blade, Angel and Umberto, Good Brothers, Andre Chase and Duke Hudson. And Tyler Bate and Pete go all the way to the end. They face Andre and Duke Hudson. But in that match, uh, Tyler sends Chase outside. He tries a Pescado, but Ridge takes the bullet. And then Chase tosses Tyler inside. And uh, hits the big high cross for the pin. Wins a gauntlet match with a high cross. So Chase U goes for the tag team titles at the uh, PLE. And uh, the story is that, you know, Andre Chase had no problem with uh, Ridge Holland getting involved, even though the rest of Chase U isn't, uh, isn't a fan of him. We had uh, several different segments setting up matches. Uh, then Ethan Page comes out for a promo. And he says Heat Wave is Sunday. He notes that Javon Evans is... A week, the, a week from Sunday. A week from Sunday. Javon is the uh, winner of the Battle Royal, but then he beat him, he says, in the main event. We did. And he says, I should be in the title match. And I, I, presu- I presumed he was going to be in the title match when he won that match. So Ava says, well, you did pin Javon. And then Sean Spears comes out and he says, you know what? I also pinned Javon. And so I should also get a shot at the title. And then Trick comes out, and he says, listen, I don't care who the opponent is going to be. It can be Ethan. It can be Javon. It can be both of them. And a big brawl breaks out. Javon hits the ring to make the save. And that sets up the main event of Trick Williams and uh, Sean Spears. We had uh, Joe Coffey and Wes Lee. This storyline has just been 50 50 them all the way to here. Joe Coffey versus Wes Lee. Wes beats him with a cardiac kick out of nowhere. So it's Wes great, Lee is getting the Obafemi title shot at Heat Wave. It's a great looking finish. Yeah. By the way, by the way, in that tag team turmoil, I really thought that Bate and Dunn looked great. Yeah. Well, they are great. Yeah. They look I mean, they, they look are great. a great team. Yeah. They look great. The thing with Idris and, and uh, Malik Blade, I mean, they only had a couple minutes, but it was really good while it lasted. Um, but yeah, all the way through, I thought those guys those guys were, were really strong. We had a great Heritage Cup match, I thought. Tony D and Nathan Frazier. Well, you know, Nathan Frazier is just I mean, Tony D's good, but Nathan Frazier, he's like special. He's he's quite spectacular. Yeah, and I mean, he he's it, it is, it's funny because he was reminding me of young Will Ospreay. You know, I mean, just where the athleticism and the speed and everything, it's like he does things everybody else does. You know, like 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 Will Ospreay we used to do when he was younger. The same moves that other people did, but somehow they looked so much better and, and more flashy because of the speed and everything that, that he did it in. And um, like everything Nathan Frazier does is just, it just looks better than it's supposed to, I guess is the best way to put it. But um, yeah, he, uh, yeah, I mean, yeah, really, really good match. Yeah, they had an excellent match. Go to the sixth round, and then finally, I mean, clean win. Uh, Nathan m- misses the Phoenix Splash. They end up on the top rope. Tony tosses him with a belly-to-belly, and then hits just about the biggest spine bust from recorded history and uh, gets the pin. So the very, one, very good match. The one thing in this one, there must have been a really long commercial break because the entire, was it third round and half the fourth were, you know, like, like they... they it was all during commercial break. Like you left. As, we, well, as, we missed the end of round three and the beginning of round four. It was almost all of round happened. three. It was almost all of round three. Yes. I mean, it was the all of round three and about the first minute and a half of round four. Yeah. So then we had Roxanne and Carmen Petrovich, where Roxanne pretty much just uh, you know beat her pretty handily. Although it did look like uh, you know she went in there and tried to call all the heat in the ring, so it's probably a good learning experience for Carmen. So that was good. And then Lola came out and decked Roxanne, Lola and Roxanne at the PLE. We had a Noam Dar segment, which was actually quite great. So he's injured legitimately. And so he's FaceTiming. And he claims that Ethan Page is the one that injured him. And then Oro sits down. And man, Oro tells his story about his upbringing 
and how he was a kid in Nigeria, never thought he'd be in NXT. When he was six, his dad almost died in a I, car wreck. I, I, I'll bet he never thought he'd be in NXT. NXT didn't exist when he was a kid. Well, that's true. His dad ran through a wall of fire to save himself. 60% of his body was burned. They had to move to Switzerland. Him and his brother moved there. They didn't know anybody. They were. Uh, his mom was in Nigeria the whole time. And he said, man, I never felt I'd make it anywhere, fit in anywhere until I met you guys. And he's going to get his revenge on Paige. This was a total babyface segment. Like, Noam Dar babyface, Lasher babyface, Jakara, especially Oro Mensa. So I guess they've turned babyface. We had Ava signing Carly versus Wendy Chu for next week. Damon Kemp versus Tavian Heights. Tavian wins. He's in the no quarter catch crew, which he did with a belly-to-belly. Got the clean pin. And so Tavian Heights is now part of the no quarter catch crew. Which is good, because he should be featured more. He's a very talented guy. Yeah, yeah, I think so, too. We had a bunch of other matches set up for next week. And then Sol Ruka versus Ariana Grace, which was okay. Sol uh, hit the Sol Snatcher for the pin. I mean, I think the problem is that she's got that giant knee brace on now. And so I think a lot of the stuff that she was really good at, this brace gets in the way. So there were a couple of spots where, you know, she slipped on the ropes here and there. But, I mean, overall it was all right. Then we had uh, Trick Williams and Sean Spears, Ethan Page on commentary. And during the match, Brooks Jensen, he's doing the Pillman thing, tries to hit the ring. They grab him. The security grabs him. They never announce who he is. They, they never, you know, make it obvious, even though it is. And so as he's being pulled away, he grabs the announce table, pulls the top off, and it hits Trick. And Trick ends up pinned by Sean Spears. So we're getting a four-way. And so, yep, they cut backstage, and Heat Wave is Trick, Javon, Sean Spears, and Ethan Page. Likely because the latter two are from Canada, and it is a Canadian PLE. But uh, that's well, what they're they... from. Ont- they're, they're both from Ontario. Yeah. So You know, that's interesting. I mean, it'd be interesting because, I mean, Trick's a super baby face, but in Ontario, when you've got two wrestlers from Ontario, maybe interesting interesting uh, crowd reactions. I thought I mean, this I show know. was much better than last week. Yeah, this one didn't do ratings. It did not, but that could have been because of last week. <laughs> so uh, the lineup for that uh, PLE, which is coming up a week from Sunday, as noted, is uh, the four-way. Nathan Frazier and Axiom versus Chase U for the tag titles. Obafemi West Lee. Roxanne versus Lola for the women's title. And Kalani Jordan versus Sol Ruka for the women's North American title. And, uh... Yeah. Can't do Trick and Javon in a singles match, but you're all right with uh, Kalani and Sol Ruka? I don't know, man. We'll see. Anyway, you got those cha- uh, collision spoilers. Yeah, yeah. So it's uh, Orange Cassidy and Ishii against Robbie Eagles and Shane Haste, which, of course, Orange Cassidy and Ishii won. I was told an awesome match. Uh, next was Stephanie Vakir against Lady Frost. Lady Frost might have gotten hurt. She was shaking. There was period she was shaken up. Um, Mercedes at ringside. Zuxis attacked Mercedes at ringside when um, Mercedes and Stephanie were um, doing a stare down. So she was in for whatever reason. Maybe she'll be at the pay-per-view. I don't know. Uh, Chris Jericho did a promo. Um, something involving a Zamboni. Uh, Joe Hook and Shibata attacked them backstage when they got into the arena jeff cobb made the save so he's the third guy so he's not defending the tv the uh, tv title on the show he's going to be uh teaming with uh jericho and big bill well there you go yeah and then uh hitch sarah and kevin blackwood obviously hitch sarah won that one tapped out uh jay white um they announced uh Jay White and the Ass Boys defending against Christian Killswitch and uh, Nick Wayne. Um, Battle of Buffalo. Um, Daniel Garcia won. Who was the other guy? Oh, the Butcher. So apparently they had a really good match. Um, fans were chanting, let's go Buffalo, since they're both from Buffalo. Uh, Hikaru Shida, who she's not on the pay-per-view either, is she? She beat Deanna Perrazzo. Nope. Uh, crowd was dead. 
They went 10 minutes. Um, I was told the match was good, uh, but no crowd reactions. Um, Dion attacked Sheeta after the match. Thunder Rosa made the save, so looks like we're getting another one of those. Maybe they're doing a best of nine. Um, they announced Will Ospreay and Swerve Strickland weigh in. We're doing a weigh in hmm. angle. Um, ELP, El Fantasmo, Jack Perry, and Takeshita against Leo Rush, Dante Martin, and Mark Briscoe. So I guess that means ELP may be in the uh, ladder match. Well, they need that uh, last guy. Yeah. Uh, Jack Perry didn't want to be in the match. Um, the heels, no, none of the heels got along. There was 15 minutes of crazy action. Um, yeah, one guy who was at the show just told me that live, he couldn't believe how good Takeshita was. Um, Takeshita hit a blue thunder bomb on Dante Martin for the pin. Um, then uh, ELP attacked Takeshita, who was his partner, uh, during the match. Jack Perry hit ELP with a TNT title belt. Um, <coughs> Dante and Leo Rush took the belt. Uh, Mark Briscoe set up a ladder and did a flip onto everyone. I heard this entire segment, this whole match and segment were tremendous. Um, then we had a weigh in. Uh, Will Ospreay cut a promo saying it's a new era, and 24 hours from now, um, he gets his grill knocked out, um, and Swerve is going to find out why Will Ospreay is on another level. Swerve said the pressure's on Will. Uh, Swerve says he's been there. Will has not been there. Um, says this will be... Um, he says Will is dressed like a bum, and he wants to offer Will a contract. Will's wife a contract, Alex Windsor. So they were not happy. And uh, Will uh, hit a hidden blade, and Will had uh, on, laid him out and had both belts. Um... There was um, there was a big weigh in and everything too. So anyway, that's the deal. All right, we got to wrap it up, everybody. New Observer is going to be out on the front page tomorrow. The back issue is up as well. We've had a lot of shows and also a lot of member exclusives, which you can always check out on the front page. And in fact, if you look up at the menu at the top, you can see uh, members home. And if you click that, all of the member-only uh, archives are up there. Uh, all of the articles Dave has been writing of late. And uh, those will all be in the Observer Expanded as well. So check that out. And that's it, everybody. We'll talk to you again after a while.